Okay, so le let's get going again. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if the camera's on. She said it's on. Okay. All right, so as I said before the break, at, behind everything was the thermochemistry. And the, what, what really helped us solve everything was the thermochemistry. So I had another student of mine, uh, Sinead Burke. She looked in the literature and gathered as much of the recent liter literature she could at the time, 2015, 2014, for low temperature species. And we tried to re-optimize the group values for the, the low temperature species that are produced. Okay, so to the, the thermochemistry that you, the group values that are used to generate the thermochemistry for alkyl peroxy radicals, hydroperoxy alkyl radicals, peroxy hydroperoxy alkyl radicals, carbonyl hydroperoxides and so on. Okay, so we tried to get as much of the literature as we could in that. And we published it in this paper here. Okay, so I, I showed you this on day one. I just reiterated it again. What, what that did was, if we plot Gibbs free energy versus reaction coordinate, in general, or on average, alkyl radicals decrease by about a half a calicarbic per mole, and the RO2 increased by about 1.4. So we made that well depth shallower by almost two calicaries per mole, which drives the equilibrium to the left. So this is the effect. These arrows are showing you the, the, the sort of equilibrium effect that it had on the system. And in general, you see the arrows are going left. It's slowing things down, right? And the, the species are less inclined to go to products, more inclined to, to stay at reactants, right? And what does that do to the prediction? It decreases the prediction, okay? But now, can you see, or if you're thinking about it, what, what will drive, what will make the system faster? If we look at, if we want reactivity at low temperature, what do we want to happen? We want the system to go to here, and eventually down to the carbonyl alkoxy radical plus OH to chain branching. Okay? Right? So to do that, we want fa the, the faster the rate of alkyl radical addition to molecular oxygen, the faster the rate of RO2 isomerization to QOH, the faster the rate, the faster we're going to get to branching. Okay? So the higher the rate, of RO2 to QOH isomerizations, that'll increase things, okay? So the thermochemistry is decreasing us, decreasing reactivity on us, but actually we're going to be able to compensate for that because we know our rate constants for RO2 to QOH isomerization and the corresponding O2 to QOH to cyclic carbonyl hydroperoxide plus OH, they're low by about an order of magnitude, okay? So if we put them increase them by an order of magnitude to what they should be, okay, it'll maybe correct this problem, okay? So this is good news, in a way, that the thermochemistry is making things slower, okay? And it was actually the key to us unraveling all of the chemistry and getting everything back in a good footing, okay? And so it, it'll really illustrate to you the importance of having good thermochemistry. So again now, Unfortunately, it's not each individual contribution, it's cumulative, okay? So one step after another, okay? So what, what I, we're going, I'm gonna show you now, so the black line in each case is the simulation from the previous slide, okay? And the red line is the new addition, all right? Just to, to follow the narrative, okay? So this red line, as I said, is the change in thermochemistry, okay? So having changed the thermochemistry, if we now use the rate constant for beta decision taken from Comandini et al., which had specifically looked at the pentyl radicals, okay, we, we see a small change in reactivity, okay, which means that there was just a small change in the rate constants between what we were using, our estimates, and what 
are measured by Camondini. Okay, and that's true. Okay, and you see it makes very little difference at high temperature, very little difference at low temperature. It's really in the NTC region that it's, it's happening. Okay, and I showed you slides yesterday that showed sensitivity to alkyl radical decomposition in isooctane. And again, you see highest sensitivity there in that intermediate temperature regime. Why? Because that's the regime where you have competition between alkyl radical decomposition and addition to molecular oxygen. And it's making a little bit of difference. Okay? Okay, so now we change the rate. We take the rate for alkyl radical plus O2, giving us RO2 from Miyoshi's calculations, published in 2012. And you can see that made no difference to the reactivity. Okay? We take the ray constants now for RO2, giving us all of them plus HO2 from Stephanie Bolanos, Carson and Dean, this study. Okay? And it makes a big difference. Decreases the reactivity. Okay? So we hadn't enough of this, the five-membered ring. Okay? I summarization. But remember now that these are effectively 10 times faster or an order of magnitude faster than what we would have been using in the previous mechanism. Okay? So hence the big, the big jump relative to what I showed just before the break for this reaction class. Okay? Okay. But now, so this was putting in the RO2, giving you all of them to SHO2. But now we add in order of magnitude faster ray constants for the isomerization of alkyl peroxy to hydroperoxy alkyl radicals. And now the system becomes so much faster. Okay? So it's pretty good. It's, it's, it's a bit slow in the NTC region, but it's too fast at low temperature. Okay? Okay? And now we also include from the same study cyclic ether formation as well, okay? And they, these are a bit faster, so now, or sorry, uh, uh, this increases the reactivity in the NTC region, but has really no effect at low temperature, okay? And the QOH bay decision products, this has no real effect, because they're not really contributing. They don't really contribute to the reactivity very much, okay? So whatever little bit of contribution, if any, it's the same in the new. Okay? So now we add, we take ray constants for, remember I said consider the hydroperoxy alkyl radical like an R radical. And it's an alkyl radical. Okay? So that adds to molecular oxygen and we get O2QOH. And we take ray constants similar to those for alkyl radical plus O2. Okay? But that does in, uh, that decreases the reactivity, actually. Okay, sorry, is that right? Yeah, decreases reactivity. Okay, so the ones that were from Miyoshi are slower than the ones we were using before. Okay, uh, I won't go into that slide. Okay, and then remember I said that the ray constant, okay, so here we have, uh, let me just show you this first. So here's uh, n-pentane. We abstract a secondary hydrogen atom. We get pen pentyl, two pentyl radical. We add to molecular oxygen. We get two pentyl peroxy. And that can I summarize via six-membered ring, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six-membered ring to give this hydroperoxy uh, two, two pentyl four hydroperoxy radical. That then can add to molecular oxygen, giving you a peroxy, hydroperoxy radical. And we can then get a six-member transition state ring again with this hydrogen atom. But here, the hydrogen atom is bonded just to a carbon, a, a, a normal secondary carbon atom. Here, the hydrogen atom is bonded to a carbon atom, which is bonded to an OOH group. And as I said, the this oxygen atom draws electron density away from the carbon, weakening the CH bond. And so we use an activation energy for this isomerization, which is three calories per mole lower than the activation energy for that one. Okay? With the same frequency factor, but the frequency factor in this case is just half of this because there's two equivalent hydrogen atoms in this case. Here there's only one. 
Okay? So for the ray constant for this reaction, we use a frequency factor, which is half this one, an activation energy, which is three catacaries per mole lower. Okay? And so in doing that, we get, and putting that change into our mechanism, so now remember all of the ray constants are now an order of magnitude faster for that second isomerization. Okay? So the simulation jumps from the black line to the red line. Okay? And now we're too fast. Okay? But we're not nearly as fast as we were with all that um, other changes that we have made previously. It's still somewhat close to the experiment. Okay. So there was one thing that we had done. Remember I said that for all um, alkyl hydroperoxides, including carbonyl hydroperoxide, to break the OO bond, you use an activation energy of about 43 kilocarriers per mole. Right? In the papers for N-heptane and isooctane, we had to lower the activation energy for those decompositions down to about 39, 40 kilocarriers per mole to get good agreement at low temperatures. Okay? So if we now, so here's our prediction with the new ray constants. But if we change the, the activation energy for the carbonyl hydroperoxide from 39 kilocarriers per mole back to 43, which it should be, the prediction becomes the red line here. And now we're a lot closer at lower temperature. Okay? And we have the right shape and so on for the simulations. Okay, and then if we take this isomerization, giving us POH by analogy with the RO2 to QOH, that makes no change. You see it's very little effect. And then if we include from, from this species, so what is this species? Does everybody know what I'm talking about with the POH2 at all? So the, this POH2 would, is this radical here. Okay? It's this radical here. So it's the guy, so what will this do? Did I say? What does that do? Yeah, immediately. So what happens is the the radical moves in here. We got the, the, the carbonyl species plus OH. Okay? That, that's very facile. Okay? But, this, but this species is an example of a POOH2 species. Okay? It's just one example. Okay? So, but you can see that, and, and just take my word for it, that this, this uh, an so what is this bond? It's a shared pair of electrons. So an electron moves in here, the electron moves down here, we get a carbonyl species plus OH. Okay, very, very easily. Okay, so, sorry. So if we have this POH2 and we include some cyclic ether plus OH, there's a, there's a little bit of change, but very little. Okay, so now, and, and if we add this O2QOH, the RO2, think of this again as an RO2, can give olefin plus HO2. Now that's having no effect on reactivity. Okay, for the second summarization. So we include all these alternatives. So here's what, what am I trying to show? Okay, here's the effect of the alternative isomerizations and POH2 giving cyclic ether plus OH on our old predictions for n-pentane. So if we take the n-heptane, isooctane, thermochemistry, and kinetics, okay, and we apply these changes to n-pentane, you can see here's the effect. So here's the base model, the black line. Here's the effect of adding in those alternative isomerizations where, where we were getting olefinic hydroperoxides plus HO2 instead of carbonyl hydroperoxides plus OH. So again, 
we have higher reactivity, or sorry, lower reactivity at lower temperature, higher reactivity at higher temperature, because we're getting, we're replacing OH radicals with HO2 radicals, okay? And then if we add the, the cyclic ethers, we're getting a huge increase in reactivity, okay? If we, if we put in those alternative isomerizations now with our current rate constants for all the reactions with the current thermochemistry, and we add the alternative isomerizations, the reactivity does decrease a little bit at low temperature and increases a little bit at high temperature, but it's very little relative to what it used to do, okay? And then if we include these cyclic ethers, we're seeing this effect, okay? So again, the effect of those is much less than it was before, okay? And, but we, and you should include them. So we have included everything in the model now. Okay. One last thing, and it, maybe it's a little bit um, too much information, but anyway. Okay, so here's the constant volume simulation results using ray constants from three different sources. So you can look at these papers. Uh, this Sharma et al paper was uh, a work performed at MIT with Bill Green's group. Okay, this is Professor Miyoshi's group, and this is the one that I've been focusing on, Stephanie Villano's work. Okay, but you see, if you take rate constants for n-pentane from all three studies, and these are the constant volume simulations, so they're all very similar. And then if you include facility effects in the simulations, actually then the model captures the data very well. Okay, so we actually now understand and pentane oxidation very well from, from that. However, if you then take all three and you apply them to isopentane, not n-pentane, you don't see the same degree of agreement. You see good agreement at low temperature, but the system's too fast at intermediate temperatures in the NTC region, okay? And what, what John had done in this case was he said, okay, we're taking the RO2 to QOH from the calculations in these three different studies. And then we do what we traditionally do. We add, subtract three catacarries per mole for the rate constants for the isomerizations from RO2 to QOH. And we subtract three catacarries per mole for the isomerization for the O2 QOH giving us carbonyl hydroperoxide plus OH, the corresponding one, okay? And by doing that, the system's too fast for the branched alkane, right? So, but fortunately, and it was only in the study from MIT with Bill's group, Bill Green's group, this study by Sharma et al., here's the citation, they actually calculated ray con specific ray constants for the second isomerization in addition to the first one. And if you use those for both N-pentane and isopentane, you now get good agreement with the data if you do the faci include facility effects, okay? So what did they do, or what are the ray constants that they calculated? So our traditional thing, you just lower the activation energy by three calories per mole. That's not a good idea, right? And so in the Sharmadal calculations, the five-member transition state rings they were lower, actually, by three calicaries per mole, 3.3. But the six-membered rings were only lower by 1.7, and the seven-membered rings were only lower by 0.4, not three and three, okay? So what does that do, okay? So what happens is your system reaches the O2QH, and then it goes to isomerize. But now the five-membered rings if there are any, are easier to isomerize, relatively speaking, compared to the six-membered rings. And the six-membered rings aren't as easy because this would have been lower by three calicaries per mole. So now you've got a 1.3 calicary per mole hit, okay, for the six-membered ring. And that 1.3 calicary per mole hit shifts the simulation from here Sorry, up to there. 
in the six member rings. That's essentially the, the key finding. So now this, the, the activation energies for the second isomerizations are 1.5, 1.3, 1.5 catacarriers per mole higher than they were. Therefore, it slows things down, ultimately. They, the, if you do the analysis, the summarization through six-membered ring transition states still dominate, but they're not nearly as dominant as they were if you just subtract three catacarriers per mole from all, all isomerizations. Okay. Okay, and hence, John, as I said, you've seen this now a few times already. Here's the agreement now for all three isomers if you do the, that analysis. So we capture the, all the data very well. Okay, so now I think we really do understand low temperature chemistry. We do understand the important reaction classes and so on that need to be included. What we really need now to do to push on is to have very accurate thermochemistry to start with and then more accurate calculations of the different reaction classes that are involved. All right. Okay. This is just showing you some more success. Okay. Um, this is something I, I, I'm proud of. You, you just have to take my word for it. So, it's, it's a bit of a Henry story. We were at a um, um, symposium, and it was actually Professor Iguang Zhu here at Princeton University, and that, that was one of the main initial organizers with, I think, Hai, Hai Wang was involved, and I don't know who else, at the symposium in... Um, Poland, in Warsaw, was the first time that we had this chemistry workshop. And then, anyway, now we have a chemistry workshop um, at the start of every symposium, a day or two before the symposium actually starts. Okay? And at the workshop, we said, well, what should we do to progress the community? And I said, let's look at the pentane isomers. And so, not only did we take these ignition delay data in the RCM shock tube, but uh, Frederic Bertrand Leclerc's group in Nancy took gestured reactor data, and hence it led to this publication. So John had been working on the, developing the mechanisms, and had, we'd had good success. And then Frederic said, okay, here's our data. And I said, John, simulate the data and see how it goes. And, and I said, please do it now as soon as you can. So he got it today, and he simulated it today. And he showed me the results, and these were the results that he he got, really, uh, without any change, okay? So, the, the, and I said, look, please send back the data immediately to Frederic so that you can see that we haven't had time to change anything. It's just what we got, okay? So, and this is what we got. So the solid line is the model prediction. The dashed line was that old mechanism that I was talking about, the Heliot al NC5 underscore 49 based on the N-heptane isooctane results, okay? So I really do strongly believe we understand now the, the low temperature chemistry, as I said. Here's then, we apply similar rules to N-butane, and you can see the solid lines are the current model predictions against the data, and the dashed lines are own model predictions, okay? So again, uh, much better agreement overall, okay? And here's some... Um, what are normalized relative intensity, these are photoionization measurements from the synchrotron at um, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, okay, taken by uh, Craig Tages's group. It was Arca Escola that published it in 2013. And what, we, do, what is plotted here are their the normalized relative intensity of the ketohydroperoxide formation with different concentrations of O2 in the mixture, okay, for isobutane. And here you see, here's previous mechanism um, as best that we could optimize those relative intensities. But here's the relative intensity now with the current chemistry. And you can see that we're capturing the relative intensities as a function of oxygen concentration very well. Okay, so it's just showing you 
more evidence that the chemistry is being well captured. Okay. And this is n-pentane, further validation. These are jet stirred reactor experiments from Philippe de Go. So Philippe also took data as part of that initiative on pe the pentane isomers and, and took it for n-pentane. And again, there was not any change in the, the optimization of the mechanism or anything. This is just ab initio, what the model predicted. And then these, these have been plotted, are added. Uh, the rate rules have been used to simulate n-hexane. We published a paper in 2015 on n-hexane. And then um, this is other gestured reactor data from Philippe on n-hexane published in that work. On n-heptane, which uh, these are data from Chesky and Adamites group. I think anyone that's worked on n-heptane oxidation has used this to validate the data. But using those rate rules again, you can see that for larger hydrocarbons, we're able to capture the data very well. Okay, and there's just more further validation. You've seen this before. This is uh, the paper that I was referring to. Okay, we had two papers. Then I said this yesterday already, that the data were used to, as a training set to optimize mechanisms for N-dodecane, C12, okay? So, training set C7 to C11, and then a mechanism for C12 was developed, okay? So, with, with good success. So, as a community, we are having good success with understanding um, uh, alkane, and not just N-alkane, but branched alkane. So, here's the hexane isomers. And that was just published this year, okay? And you, you see again, we've good agreement. So our understanding is evolving all the time and we're getting better and better, even with branched alkanes now, okay? At low temperatures, okay? So uh, uh, this is uh, a picture of Colin Banyan. He graduated last year with his PhD and he uh, did the experiments here for this publication, okay? But not only, so these are the hexane isomers. This is the agreement now of the model as presented. One thing I just wanted to show you here, here we have N-hexane. Here we have 2-methylbutane and 3-methyl, sorry, 2-methyl and 3-methyl pentane, I should say. The, the research octane numbers are very similar. And you can see that the reactivity in the, these are data taken in a rapid compression machine. So the ignition delay time as a function of inverse temperature are very similar. Okay, and then we go to 2,2-dimethylbutane, an octane number of 91.8. Again, the reactivity decreases, okay, with, with octane number. And then 2,3-dimethylbutane, it has a research octane number of 104.3. It's the slowest to ignite. So you can see here, actually, okay, N-pentane, sorry, N-hexane, and 2 and 3-methylpentane, these reactivities aren't very similar at lower temperatures, but you can see down at the lowest temperature, they're all about the same, okay? But in the negative temperature coefficient regime is where they're all different. And then at high temperatures, they're all the same again, okay? So, and it's in this area that you want to measure the differences or uh, record the differences in reactivity. Now, just Somebody was asking, why are you showing shock tube? Do you not use other data to validate the mechanisms? We do, okay? But it's just I have, we have shock tube and RCMs in my group, and I'm using these as examples all the time because I'm more familiar with them, okay? And, but if you did this reactivity for these fuels in a jet stirred reactor, a flow reactor, you'd see the same thing. At very low temperatures, they'd be very similar. At high temperatures, they'd be very similar. But in this temperature regime, that have very different reactivities, okay? So the, you see the most. And so um, somebody was saying, why do you use RCMs to study these fuels? We do because, you, first of all, you can see the time scale here. You're in the 10, 100, even out to about 300 millisecond time scale. There's no way in a shock tube you're gonna get out to 300 milliseconds, okay? And again, it's the time scale in the facility that you're trying to, to study. So it's nice to have the RCM facility to be
be able to study these fuels under the, at those times. Okay, so not only did Conan study the hex, hexane isomers, but he also studied the heptane isomers. So here we have the octane number, and there's nine different isomers for n-heptane, or sorry, for heptane, one of which is n-heptane, okay, with different octane numbers. And you can see, if I go back, sorry, so here's straight-chained n-hexane, then the two branched ones have similar octane numbers. But the more highly the, more highly the branching, the higher the branching, the higher the octane number, okay? And it's the same for the heptane isomers. The higher the branching, the higher the octane number, okay? So this uh, triply branched isomer has an octane number 112, okay? And you, we see also here, I, we've, these are data taken at 10 bar, and these are data taken at 20 bar. They're unpublished. We haven't published them yet but we're working on it currently, right? And you can see again, the highest reactivity is n-heptane. It's so reactive, actually, we can't measure ignition delay times in the RCM. Uh, it's, they're so short, okay? You need, we need to use the shock tube, okay? But if we look at 2-methyl, 3-methyl, you can see the difference in reactivity, again, of the different fuels, okay? And actually, 2-2-3-trimethylbutane with an octane number of 112, is so unreactive that we, it's not plotted on this graph. It doesn't appear, okay? So we can only measure it at 20 bar. At 10 bar, it's too slow to ignite. At 20 bar even, and you can see the magnitude of the difference in reactivity of it relative to the other isomers, okay? So it's very resistant to water ignition, okay? Uh, but we have data with which to validate the model. So that's just showing you, okay? Um, that's just then just the hexanes and the heptanes compared together. Okay, so to conclude, the low temperature chemistry. So now we, you know, I, I, stood, I spoke about the high temperature the first day, intermediate temperature yesterday, and then a lot of the low temperature really focusing on the low temperature this morning. Okay, so we re-evaluated re our understanding of the low temperature oxidation of alkanes. I was really worried in the mid noughties that we really did, didn't understand it fully. But a lot of that understanding actually was really stemmed from not understanding or having good, accurate thermochemistry of the species. Okay, so we've, we, we've developed rate rules for reaction classes, important, not only in, at high temperatures but also at low temperatures. Alternative pathways have little effect on our simulation results now, okay? So the, the general understanding that we had published through the years is correct, and we have found the source of the long-standing discrepancy between the mechanisms, and it's mainly due to the thermochemistry. So what we would like to do is to revisit the primary reference fields again, update those mechanisms, which we have been doing, and apply new thermochemical properties, rate constants, and alternative pathways to all the larger alkanes, okay, as a community. Okay, so let's maybe, I know it's a bit short, but let's take a break again now. And we come back and we do the biofuels last, okay? <laughs>